Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast where we focus in on teamwork, leadership, and culture within an organization, within a family, within a home, within a nonprofit. What we're saying is teamwork is just not for sports anymore. It's everywhere. Hi, I'm Greg Gregory, your host of the Teamwork Advantage, and we're fortunate to have with us today Ken Blackwell, joining us from New Jersey. And Ken is a, an experienced speaker, trainer, facilitator, and consultant. With over 24 years, he's had the privilege to help leaders and teams from amazing companies across the U.S. and around the world. As Ken likes to put it, he rescues accidental leaders and dysfunctional teams by helping them connect, communicate, and collaborate. That's going to be a powerful thing we want to talk about a little bit more. He also believes that so often it's the gap between our intent uh, and our impact that prevents us from achieving our own goals, whether it's professional or personal goals. Closing that gap can bring great success, and that's where Ken strives to really focus and make a difference. He has his own podcast called Insight at Work, and that's where he talks with people from diverse fields and explores the insights and breakthroughs that have changed the way they work and sometimes even transformed the way they live their lives. Because let's face it, folks, if you're listening to this podcast today, whether you're walking the dog or driving the car, let me tell you, you're combining your work life and your professional life every day of the week. Ken Blackwell, welcome to the Teamwork Advantage. Greg, thank you so much for having me. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, we talked there about your background for over 24 years, you've been doing this, but so often people say, well, how did he get there in the first place? You know, what gives him the street cred? What gives him the credibility? You know, uh, what's his claim to fame, as my late wife used to put it all the time. <laughs> so tell us what got you to where you are and how you, how you got to what you're doing. Well, one of the reasons that I, I have such an affinity for accidental leaders is because I think of myself as one. Okay. Uh, you know, I did not grow up uh, thinking about, you know, when I get older, what I really want to do is I want to become a consultant. I want to become a coach. Um, you know, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman like all the other kids. Uh, in fact, what I did really want to do first off was be a commercial photographer. Uh, and that's what I was going to school for. Uh, I was in college and, you know, got a college job doing some kind of wild, crazy stuff that I now know to be team building and was learning how to be a facilitator. And so when we had a dorm floor that wasn't getting along, the RA would send them over to, to our department, the Outdoor Experiential Education Department. Uh, and we would wait, do wait, 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 courses. Say, say that one again, the Outdoor? The outdoor Experiential Education Department. Okay. Yeah. So in a sense, a little bit like Outward Bound. Um, and, you know, so yeah, we did, you know, canoe trips for, you know, kind of gym credit, but uh, yeah, we'd also do, uh, you know, groups that were, were struggling and even started working with some groups in the community because we had the facilities and we had trained facilitators. And, you know, that was just something fun that I did in, in college. Didn't really think that much about it. Came back to New Jersey, was working in, in photography and by accident came across a company that was doing that crazy stuff that I did in college. And, you know, one thing led to another. And then you get to one of those career points where you're like, okay, I need to make a decision here. And it was either to invest a ton of money into a studio and buying a lot of photography equipment, more than I already had, or make a transition. Uh, my self-assessment was, you know, I'm a, I'm a really good, but not great photographer. Uh, and this other stuff, I actually really like a whole lot more. I get a whole lot more passion out of it. Uh, I seem to actually be better at it. Uh, and so I made that shift and uh, that turned out to be very prescient because uh, just a couple of years later, uh, digital hit and blew up the commercial photography industry, um, wiped out a lot of people because it became so much easier, uh, you know, to, to do photography. So disruption on, a, on a, just a global level. Uh, and then, you know, for the last 24, 25 years, I have been working with teams, leaders, as you work with leaders, that's developed into executive coaching, and then, you know, kind of just expanding that out as you go. But the core of it has always been, how do we get along? Um, what, what are the interplays between us? And that, that goes right back to college is, okay, what was, what's not working here? 
Um, and the essence of that is, is relationship and connection. It's mm -hmm. fascinating because so many folks that I've talked to on the uh, podcast here, I'm sure you've run across this as well. They're not really doing what they set out in college or in life to do. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I came through a real estate and mortgage banking background, and I just kind of enjoy taking seminars and training classes. Next thing you know, I said, I think I might like to try that. And next thing you know, I got a contract to doing it. And, you know, it's, it's one of those accidental things that come into play and it ignites a fire that's just fascinating for all of us. What is an accidental leader now? So you, you work with them and you rescue accidental leaders. So tell us about that. Dysfunctional teams, we've all heard the term. But what is an accidental leader? Are you talking about somebody who got promoted, didn't want to be promoted, or what are we looking at? Sometimes, uh, you know, as you're just saying, the, the path that we start out on isn't the path that we end up on. Right. And, and sometimes that's because of different choices we make. Uh, and I think, you know, that we explore uh, in college and that we, we open our horizons some, uh, and then we find maybe what our true calling is. I think that's a fabulous thing. But in work, uh, there are times when somebody is really focused on that thing that they're doing and suddenly find themselves uh, looking around and saying, well, I, hey, I'm, I'm actually in charge of these people. <laughs> I've got a team. Um, they're all looking at me for answers. What do I do? Um, I've coached some folks who, uh, one guy in particular I'm thinking of, uh, knew he was going to get a promotion um, because, you know, a, a fellow above him was, was going to retire. And then his boss took a package to go somewhere else. And he suddenly found himself promoted, not one level, but two. Wow. The scope of making that, that two level jump was enormous and overwhelming. And, you know, he was really at sea. He was lost. He just wasn't anchored. Um, sadly, the organization didn't help him uh, by really onboarding him into that role. Uh, and so, yeah, he found himself there through circumstance that was completely unplanned for. Uh, it would have been a big jump just making the, the promotion that he thought he was going to get, but to then go that extra level, uh, and now he's at sea. And, and there are technical folks that I deal with also who, you know, are, are there because they're a brilliant researcher or they're an amazing uh, technician or project manager. And suddenly, you know, they find themselves on this career track where, oh, yeah, I, I said yes to that because it was a raise and a promotion. And, and I kind of overlook the fact that it, it people management mm -hmm. is part of that job. It's uh, a and, huge and, part of that job. Yeah. And, and in fact, sometimes it's a completely different job. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think of the, the sales folks that I deal with, you often have that really talented, amazing sales professional who gets promoted to sales manager and then suddenly isn't doing sales anymore, but people management and, and yep. they struggle. Yeah. Most, I, I found out that a lot of people in management in the first level leadership anyway, a lot of them got the job because they did the job right. They did the job very well. And then they say, okay, I can do this. So they even apply for, or sometimes they just get promoted into uh, a sales management or a next level leadership, and they don't have a clue what they're doing. And then they fail. And they don't know who to blame. They want to blame themselves. They want to blame the company. The bottom line was everybody's a little bit at fault because we're not giving them the proper training. So what's something you do with these leaders? What? What's something that you uh, pride yourself on in helping these leaders do once they've been realized they're accidentally in leadership? I think part of the biggest thing that they need is perspective. Mm -hmm. Because when you're untethered, when you're unanchored, when you're bobbing around, <clears throat> when you're bobbing around, um, yeah, you, you don't know which way's up. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, to just have someone there who's on their side who's working for them rather than the organization, someone who doesn't have a political agenda, someone who doesn't have the company's interest over theirs, um, suddenly that gives them a reference point. And I think my best, my best self is being a mirror, being a clean, clean mirror that allows them to see themselves, uh, many times to see and hear the things that they're saying, um, because that's their answer. 
You know, it's not that I'm bringing their answer. They usually have it. But because of all the things that are going on, um, and again, yeah. not being anchored down, they can't see or hear it. But being able to reflect that back, even if it's something they disagree with, that suddenly becomes a reference point. Right. Uh, and enables them to start to figure out what's what's the path ahead. Right. And what you're doing is you're helping guide them there. Um, you're not telling them how to do it. And that, that's that's key. It's like, I'm here in Annapolis, Maryland, and we go out on the boats. And when I take people out on a boat, we often say that if we do have somebody fall overboard, keep your eye on them. Keep your eye on them. Because if you think about it, somebody falls overboard, they're like a little coconut bouncing around in the water. It is easy to lose sight of them quickly. Mm -hmm. So when we keep our eye on them, then we can know what to do, how to throw them a lifeline, whether we, what we do here, how do we do certain things? How does the captain react? Everything kind of comes into play and the team starts to work together for that. And that's in, in essence, what a coach is doing is giving you that lifeline, letting you keeping their eye on you and helping you go through that. Is, is that a, a marginal I think that's analogy? A, an, an excellent metaphor um, because those accidental leaders, yeah, they've, they've fallen overboard. Um, or sometimes sort of been shoved <laughs> as, as circumstance <laughs> might have shoved them off, off the side. Uh, oh, let's and, not go to the shoving part of aspect yeah. of things. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes actually, they may have just jumped. Well, you know, sometimes you, you think there's going to be some solid ground there and there isn't, you know, or, or the deck was like there the a moment ago and it shifted and now suddenly, oh, the landscape's different. And, um, now I'm, I'm fighting for my life. Yeah. Like so, a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, which has caused such amazing disruption. Right. So let's talk we're... about the pandemic. I mean, there's people that are saying we're coming out of it. Some people say we're not coming out of it. Some people say we won't be out of it for another year. Regardless of that, how has the pandemic changed our leadership, even in the last 18 months? I think one of the amazing things that's done is it's broken down some walls. Um, because of Zoom, you know, because of video conferencing, we're now seeing into people's homes. Uh, you know, now some folks, you know, have got the, the green screen up and, and you know, uh, but other folks, it's like, okay, yeah, you're seeing some of their, their decorations, you're seeing some of their family life. Um, it wasn't that long ago that uh, there was a, a professor being interviewed on the BBC and his young toddler came, you know, coming into the room and it was scandalous. Oh my goodness, terrible. And, and he was you know, incredibly embarrassed and his wife was embarrassed and oh my heavens, that's gone away, yeah. right? So there's, there's some artificial facade, I think that has been knocked away. Yeah. And we're starting to really see people now, which I think is a really good thing. I think being able to start to connect with folks uh, is good. Again, you, were, you said the key word there and it's people. Whether we're in Zoom or whether we're in person, we are people. And I, I, my, one of my phrases is perfection is something to shoot for that you know you will never achieve because it can't happen. And so recognizing that and being real, being vulnerable is, is such a powerful tool for all of that. So how has, what have you done with your leaders to transform them to being able to work either 100% virtually or in a hybrid environment. Um, and it does it differ depending upon the industry that you're in? Well, I'm going to go back to a word you just used, which is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is one of the keys. Mm -hmm. One of the facades that existed pre-pandemic was this of the, you know, all-knowing, all perfect, you know, wonderful leader, no flaws, knows everything, will give direction. And we've seen that, wow, well, circumstance is not letting him play that role. Yeah. Um, we've got to, we've got to change. It's always pandemic. been true though. Am I right? Exactly. It's this always it's been true. Song. It's just now the pandemic is allowing it to be more to the forefront. The pandemic is Toto in the Wizard of Oz grabbing the curtain and pulling it away to see the professor back there working the machines that are creating the Wizard of Oz image and the flames and, and all that, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the green curtain. Um, yes, this has always been the case, but the facade and the holding of it is one of the things that has held us back. Um, 
leaders not being willing to be vulnerable has held us back and held them back. And so being open, being honest, having some uh, some frankness, being candid, mm -hmm. uh, all of these traits, I think, are coming out of the pandemic because it's forcing some of us to be there. Um, but I think we're also seeing it is the way through and, and rethinking how we're setting up these relationships between leaders and their teams, uh, individuals, colleagues. We're having to navigate a new medium of interaction. Uh, there's a lot of people who are saying that, you know, oh, it's terrible. I'm, I'm burned out with all of this. Um, I, I don't think it's the medium uh, that's the issue here. I think it's how we're going about trying to connect with one another, how we're going about interacting yeah. with one another and the it's roles. how we're using talking. the medium. Exactly. Exactly. Um, people have talked about the, the shift to virtual. Uh, and I was talking the other day, it's like, I've been using virtual technology pretty much all my career. Um, I used to coach folks virtually, uh, you know, 20 some years ago, we used this technology called the telephone. Uh, and it allowed me to be in New Jersey and them in Texas or California or Utah, wherever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. um, and we're able to do that work. And, and now we just have, you know, some more information flowing through. It's not just audio. We have, we have visual now too. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's, it's how we're using this medium. And I think one of the things the pandemic is, is forcing us to do and leaders need to do is to really think about that. Um, and be intentional about that. It's not just, um, you know, the computer version of real life. Yeah. Um, not the computer screen version of real life. It's a different medium and it needs to be approached differently. Absolutely. And the biggest challenge that a lot of my clients have come across is they're not having those um, impromptu conversations, water cooler conversations, lunchroom meetings, yeah. elevator talks, anything of that nature is just not happening. And they're, quote, on all the time when they're on the screen. They've got to be on. They've got to be turned on. They've got to be into it. You know, and that's not necessarily the case. There are some people in the neurodiverse arenas where they're uncomfortable being on camera. And yet they're brilliant people, so they can bring things in. So the leader has to recognize that aspect of it. You've got others that when they're focused on, on the camera all the time or on the screen all the time, they get burned out so easily and they need to, you know, change. I mean, it's been said that when we're on camera, our blink rate drops 20 to 30%. And so the question is, what have you done with leaders to help them be better leaders? And what advice have you given them? And if you could give a leader advice today, you know, working in either a fully virtual or a hybrid, what would you tell them today to do that's probably one of the best things they need to do and focus on? I, I think it's investments in their people and specifically investments in some of the things you just mentioned, right? The, the interactions that create connection with each other. Uh, we're not having those. We have squeezed our interactions to being all business. We're on, we got a meeting, we got a Zoom. Okay, we've got an agenda. We are, we're blasting through business and we're not taking the time to check in with one another. And mm -hmm. that's okay in a very short amount of time, uh, you know, over a short duration, but this mm -hmm. is lasting months and years now, right? So yeah, we're a year and a half. We, yeah, we, we've got to reconnect there, um, or rethink about where we're spending our time. That may then fall back to, well, what kind of work are we expecting? You know, what, what sort of timelines are we setting up? Do we need to change that? Um, if we're taking some more time to get to know each other and, and check in, we not, may not be able to get through as much business. So let's maybe adjust our agenda a little bit. The strange thing is, I think if you're investing in that connective time with one another, that, that human time, you actually speed things up. And you speed things up because people aren't getting as fatigued. They're not right. getting as worn down. Um, they're feeling better, right? I mean, there's a lot of isolation that's going on right now. So the ability to, to connect with somebody can be huge. And that uplift in our spirit uh, that comes from the connection we have with another human being can power us for, for hours and days. But we've got, as leaders, we've got to put in that time. Yeah. 
um, and, and, and do it. As a, as a board chair for a local nonprofit, the first item on our agenda is always a check-in with each member. Uh, and that includes the staff. We go around the horn, you know, what's, what's new since the last time we gathered? You know, what's, what's a joy? What's a sorrow? What's, what's happening in your life? And you find out about somebody who's getting ready to send, you know, their oldest off to college for the first time, uh, or someone who's welcoming a new grandchild, or someone who's dealing with a, an ill parent. And it changes the tenor of our meetings. And it, it brings that humanness and that connection that actually makes us more efficient in the things that we're doing together. Yeah. So you might look at that and say, gosh, you're, you guys are spending the first 20, 25 minutes doing this. Isn't that a waste of time? And I would no. say, no, not at all. No. It's in fact, the most valuable time that we have on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. I did that on a board meeting when I was the president of our association at our annual retreat. It was an all day retreat. We took the first two hours doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. And what we found, and tell, correct me if I'm wrong, but we found we had a better connection, no doubt. We also had a better level of trust. How important is the trust in a leadership capacity in this pandemic? It's the only thing that matters, I think. Okay. I, I, I think that we, we overvalue technical skill. We overvalue... Um, you know, delivering on, uh, on KPIs, trust is the key thing. And from a leadership perspective, everything I think has to be looked at through that lens. Um, if you're not doing things that are building trust, um, I think it's probably bleeding away. I, I don't think there's a neutral. If we're not bleeding, it's, if we're not building the trust, we're bleeding the trust. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing? What are you doing to connect with your people and build some trust every day? If you think about it like a bank account, if, if that's how your, your brain works, are you making deposits? Because every time you, you, you push somebody, you, you need something, that, that's a withdrawal. Yeah, um, you're, you're, you're right back it. at, uh, what is it? Habit number one from Dr. Stephen Covey? Yes, yes. Okay, the emotional bank accounts and being proactive. There's absolutely no doubt about it. We've got to make deposits into different people's emotional bank accounts. And, and I think what we're finding out is nothing's really changed in this pandemic. It's just how we go about making that. The, the fact of what we have to do does not change. Maybe how we go about doing it changes. Um, yeah. I had one client who actually literally uh, put up a virtual water cooler in his, in, in, behind his screen, bought a water cooler and set it up in the back. Says, here's our virtual water cooler. Let's have our conversation and things of that nature, anything at all to create that continuity. I love that. What are some things you're seeing? What are things that you have seen your clients doing um, from a leadership standpoint, either at an executive level or all the way through to a small team? What are, what are you noticing? The, the era of the virtual happy hour is, is long dead. Um, you know, that it was a that good That worked try. for a few months. It, it was. It really was. And, and, you know, kudos to those who did that. And, 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 you know, maybe here and there, but I think uh, as with anything too much of it in your diet and it gets to be not a good thing. Yes. It, right now it's, we're in this interesting place where we're really struggling with uh, some decisions around how do we actually team uh, particularly as uh, we, we return to the office now that's not full on. So some are returning to the office, some aren't. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, rules and regulations within some buildings. Um, teams that are coming back are finding that they actually can't meet because the conference rooms, the, the, the number of folks who can meet in those conference rooms have been halved and there just aren't enough conference rooms to go around. So then they're wondering, so we, we came back so that we, would, we could meet and we can't meet now. <laughs> or we have to be so far apart from each other that we can't meet. Should we just go back to Zoom? We're actually doing it okay then? So some of these real life struggles of the logistics of how are we going to return to the office um, when we've got these, these hybrid rules and, and safety rules to deal with. Yeah. And I'm seeing reports all over the place about how many people, percentages of people who would rather just stay working virtually the whole time. And I think from a productivity standpoint, I think I get that. 
from a continuity standpoint, I'm not sure. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I think that's the big question, right? Is, okay, we can actually do work. And I think when people are given the freedom to design their work day, um, particularly when there's not other uh, impinging factors on them, I, I think they're going to make better decisions there. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, all right, how is it that we do need to come together and for what? There's a big argument that collaboration needs to happen face to face. I think it can happen face to face really effectively, but I also think it can happen virtually mm -hmm. really effectively. Uh, and, and that's the experiment that a lot of clients are going through is trying to figure out, well, how, how do we do this? The tools are getting there. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the great changes that's happened with the pandemic is that we just are getting more and more tools. You know, as there's economic opportunity right now, companies are putting energy there uh, and designing these tools for us to use. And whether it's, you know, Miro boards or, you know, any of the other uh, ways that we can collaborate and the virtual whiteboards, um, you know, those things might make it a little bit easier to do that virtually. But the the little things, I think, are where we're struggling to figure out how to backfill. Um, it's the, yeah, you know, those water cooler conversations, the, uh, the asides to folks, the you've got a quick question, because our communication is now forced into a much more intentional uh, mode. You know, we've, right. we've got to think, think about picking up the phone to call someone, sending an email, sending an IM if you're, you're on that system. Um, and, and that's in some ways a good thing. I think back to your, your question about or, or comment about productivity, um, not being interrupted constantly by someone coming down the hall going, Hey, I got a quick question for you. And you were right in the middle of something, you know, that that's actually a good thing. Um, but yet, you know, it's, it's maybe what we've been used to. I think there's a, there's an element of all of this that we are, we're missing the familiar, even if the familiar wasn't great. Yeah, I mean, if the familiar was, wasn't yeah. helpful, we're missing the familiar of that. Do you think that if we go back to more in-person work, that that familiar has changed? And by trying to do what was familiar 24 months ago, now is the unfamiliar and causing problems? Is that a possibility? Oh, I, I think so. And I think, you know, as a, a cautionary tale for leaders, thinking that you're going to go back to the modalities of the past and the way things worked in its entirety in the past, people have changed, people have evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that period of time early on when it was kind of like an extended snow day. And if we could just hold our breath long enough, we'll get to the other side of it and then everything will snap back. Yep. We've passed that. Yeah. And now people have started to evolve and change. And so one of the challenges for leadership is going to be redesigning our workplace and how we do this um, and being open to that. So I think a key skill for leaders is going to be, and this again is nothing new, it goes back to the beginning of time, but it's listening, listening yeah. and asking some really good questions of your people. And they with you can co-create what that future workplace looks like. Um, but, and it's possible that somebody, if you're the leader, it's possible that somebody may have a better idea than you have, and that's okay. Yes, right, which goes back to this, this bit of vulnerability. Absolutely. You know, if, if you're a, a invulnerable leader, one who's suited up, um, has to be that person with all the right answers, you're, you're going to block and squash mm -hmm. you know, that better idea because it yeah. didn't come from you. Being invulnerable also leads to being insecure. So yes, well, right, and and one one feeds the other here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so being so being open to to this different way of of being together, mm -hmm. um, and I think to a certain extent we romanticize the past. You know, yes. it's oh gosh, we just got back to normal. Well, if you recall, we were complaining about it back then, right? We were complaining about work. We were complaining about how our bosses treated us. We're complaining about other coworkers. The have there was, been was no some, have there, in your eyes, have there been some leaders who have done it exceptionally well in a company and others that have just fallen flat on their face? I think it's, it's what I was just saying in terms of the, the listening and the, the openness mm -hmm. that seems to really be the, the key. Those who are succeeding, those whose teams are, are thriving 
are ones who are opening themselves up, allowing the team to drive things more than, than they, the leader. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones, the ones that are holding on to the top down, you've got to do it this way. Let me be directing. Um, those are the ones that are really struggling. So what can a leader do today or what should leaders be doing today? Okay. And we've talked about, you know, communication, opening up, being vulnerable, all those things with that in place, what, what can leaders or what should they be doing today to plan for the future? Keeping in mind, we don't even know what the future holds. What do you think? I, I think it is reprioritizing a bit uh, and reprioritizing people, people over profits, people over mm -hmm. process. Uh, our success right. in the future is going to be driven through our ability to get the best out of our people. And, and so then we have to ask, so what are the environments? What are the, the things that gets the best out of people? Even if you're on a manufacturing floor, the world we live in now is one that is driven or the work that we do is driven by our thinking. Even if you're operating a machine, you, you need to be thinking about how that machine is operating. Um, you need to be able to problem solve. You need to be able to, to see things before they happen. So we need to think about what are the environments that allow people to do their best thinking. Okay. And we know this, right? This, this comes from, from trust, from safety, um, from being valued, right? Getting recognition, being able to do work, which is meaningful, right? To be engaged, you know, again, and none of this is new. We've been talking about this. I know you and I have for, yeah. for years and years and years with our clients, yeah. right? Um, but it's just even more important now. It's mm -hmm. not nice to have, these are going to be must haves. So you and I are come from a lot of the same backgrounds mm -hmm. um, with the uh, programs, the five behaviors of cohesive teams, understanding the everything disc models. Have you seen that through the pandemic, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtual or hybrid, are there changes in the way that people's behaviors are noticed, amplified, reduced? What are you noticing because of everything? There's a couple of things that I'm seeing as patterns. Um, mm -hmm. So one is the, the natural consequence of the change in communication media that we've been talking about right. and not being able to, to sit down and have that chat with someone where, where maybe the two peers aren't, aren't quite getting along. Um, and I was just coaching one of my, my clients through that really saying, okay, you know, you, 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 you've got this conflict. You're going to have to have a conversation about it. You're going to need to sit down and be very, very intentional about this. This isn't something that you can just kind of happenstance work out at the lunchroom table. Um, and, and so, you know, she did, she had that conversation and, and was very open and very vulnerable. And, and was asking her colleague, you know, what can I do to help you be better? Um, and that, you know, kind of lowered the, the defensiveness, opened the floodgates, and now they are cooking, right? Things are, are really great between them, but she had to take the first step. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we're a bit reluctant to, because of the other trend that I see, and that is that we have to recognize we've all been subjected to one level of trauma or another. Uh, and this trauma we've been okay. calling the pandemic, but the impact of it is no different than uh, any other trauma. And, and, you know, you've gone through, through loss. I know, um, you know, the, the stress and the things that happened to us emotionally, um, having our lives upended, that's a trauma. Having kids that used to go to school, not going to school, not having a daycare option. Um, it, all of these things are traumas and I think we have to recognize that in ourselves and each other. Um, I thought I was doing really good, managing things really awesomely. And then I've hit a couple of points where it's like, you know, I, I got to say, I think I'm a little depressed today. I think I'm a little down. I think, yeah. uh, you know, okay, I need to take care of myself. Uh, let, and I think that has really manifested itself in the post-Olympic timeframe now with everything that transpired during the 2021 Summer Olympics. 
And it's allowing ourselves to step back. It's allowing ourselves to work on ourselves. It's, it's allowing other people that freedom to do the same thing. And I think that's, that's just absolutely critical today because you said it, the pandemic has affected everybody and it's affected people in different ways. Some people have become more productive. Some people, again, if we look at the neurodiverse environment, some of the people that are um, maybe on the autistic spectrum, because of this, they don't have to have the interactions with people as much. Their productivity has gone up and they're actually very powerful and vibrant people in today's workforce. Whereas in a more traditional environment or our old normal, they suffered from that. So we've got to recognize everything affects different people differently. And I, I think that's in my eyes are that's just one of the bigger challenges as we start to look at it. So the question now becomes leaders and teams getting together. Are there things that the team members can do? Are there things that executives can do? What, what are a few things you would recommend for a team today the team, not just the leader now, not just that accidental leader, but what are some things the team can do today to kind of build this and bring this cohesion uh, back together? To, to extend what you were saying a little earlier too, I think a, a way for us to, to think about all of this is the difference between the seen and the unseen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, thank you, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles for highlighting the unseen uh, and, and bringing it out. You know, we wouldn't think twice about asking someone who was a paraplegic uh, to do a flight of stairs. But we're, we're blind sometimes because we can't see it to asking someone to do something that mentally, emotionally, they're not there to do. Yeah. And I think then this is an area of opportunity for us to not only take care of ourselves, but to extend that a bit and take care of each other. And as teammates, to reach out once in a while, check in on each other. Hey, how you doing? Right. Uh, to be maybe a little bit of a cheerleader for one another. You know, the, the, the psychological safety um, that we, we talk about when we have these environments of trust you know, come from knowing that you can be vulnerable, that you can open up and won't be attacked uh, for doing so. But it goes beyond that, I think, in that, you know, we actually have to be a little more active in, you know, cheering ourselves on, um, you know, putting out those, those attaboys, um, you know, the, the, the figurative pat on the back, um, not in a platitude, you know, not in a, in a meaningless or empty way, but in a really <laughs> heartfelt way. Yeah. Um, and I think that starts to help also help build connection. Um, I've got groups that I work with very intimately that I don't really have a great connection with, even though we're, we're so intensely working together and others where the connections are a little bit looser, but there's more heart there um, that I would go to the ends of the earth for. Yeah. Right. So it's, so it's not about the, um, the amount of work or, or the closeness of it, but the quality of the interaction, right? So, so maybe let's think about the quality of our interaction, our interaction. And, and, yeah. And, and how can we make the best out of that? If particularly if we're limited a bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with a virtual world, well, let's, let's take advantage of those interactions and, you know, maybe start with a little bit of a check-in and, and how you're doing. Um, make a little bit more allowances for each other. There's, there's an anger out there that if you have driven it all uh, in the last few months, you've experienced. Um, I've never seen it in my lifetime. There's just a, a road rage, uh, people cutting each other off. It is yeah. nuts. And it's not just on the roads, yeah. it's everywhere. People are short. And again, it's this the trauma. Oh, standing in line at the coffee shop, at the grocery store. Yeah. It doesn't matter, the parking lot. Um, it's, we've got to take a step back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, all those people that you see in the coffee shop and you're like, wow, oh, those people are really angry. Well, guess what? You're working with some of them, right? I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they're all out there and, and we're all traumatized yeah. a bit. So we just need to give each other a bit more grace, Yeah. you know, just maybe give them a benefit of the doubt a little bit, just pull back. 
which is hard to do when we ourselves, right, need some of that, right? So right. Uh, perhaps we can give it's it to ourselves It's hard for us to pull first. ourselves back. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, perhaps we start with ourselves. But, you know, myself, I, I find it easier to, to extend grace um, and, and, you know, that, that heartfelt things to others. And then, you know, myself kind of catches up behind yeah. that a bit. Um, I'm so using, uh, works for you. Yeah, I'm using something that some people don't even realize I'm using at times. And that is I'm having people hold me accountable or I'm checking in on them for that same reason, because I can't control myself. Sometimes I want to just keep pushing. So I need somebody else to say, Hey, it's okay to slow down. You know, things like that. And that, I think that's so critical. As we wrap things up here today, because we could go on for this for a long time right now. But as we start to wrap it up, question is, are you seeing more accidental leaders since the pandemic? Or are there fewer? What are your, what are your just off the cuff thoughts on that? Um, I'm seeing a few more uh, in that we're seeing a lot more turnover. I mean, uh, you, you don't have yep. to look at the news too deeply uh, to see this turnover. And, you know, my take on it is that it's not the great resignation because people aren't quitting work. Uh, they're not stopping. They're not leaving the workforce. Um, they're leaving jobs. They're leaving bad work environments. They're mm -hmm. leaving leaders that don't inspire them. Um, they're, they're leaving, you know, low wage uh, situations, but they're going yeah. off and they're doing something else. Yeah. So um, there's a tremendous amount of turnover that is absolutely going to lead to uh, more folks kind of in that accidental leader place. Um, but, you know, this is both a danger and an opportunity for individuals and, and leaders um, as people reassess, you know, hmm, what is it about work that, that I like and I'm willing to do? you better have a workplace, you better have an organizational culture that is going to draw people in because what used to work or what you used to be able to get away with, you're not going to be yeah. get away with anymore. Yeah. It's like the old commercial back in the day. It's not your father's business anymore. Yeah. It's not the yeah. same environment. Yeah. Ken Blackwell with Enclaritas. How can people reach you? We see you're uh, on the screen here. If you're watching this on video, he's got it up there, but why don't you spell it out for everybody? So uh, those that are listening, can find you and search you out for anything. Sure. So the, the company that I have is called Inclaritas, and that's I-N-K-L-A-R-I-T-A-S.com. Uh, you can hear me uh, fairly regularly on my podcast. That's Insight at Work. Uh, and I think now you can, you can find it pretty easily. But if you search Insight at Work with Ken Blackwell, uh, it should pop right up. And uh, every now and again, I get myself on Twitter too, uh, at K underscore Blackwell. All right. Well, Ken, it's a privilege to have you on board here. Uh, the work that you do, uh, helping teams, helping accidental leaders is absolutely invaluable. Uh, organizations need to reach out to people like yourself to help them grow and focus in on the people aspect of it, because that's where most organizations are really suffering today. It's not in the financials necessarily. They're suffering in the people, which, of course, is impacting the financials. Thank you once again, Ken Blackwell, for joining us right here on the Teamwork Advantage, where, you know, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, you can gain skills. And Ken's helped us with some of those today that are both insightful, impactful, and ideas that you can use right away. You know, my expression has always been, uh, having an average day is just being average. So until next week, remember, you're not average. So when you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, be sure to make it an excellent and exceptional day. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.